This video is brought to you by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creative people where millions get to explore together. Skillshare has got thousands of classes. As artists, you're going to love discovering topics in fine art, illustration, and more. Lots of Skillshare classes are under 60 minutes. With short lessons, you can fit them into the busiest of schedules. I thought at first I was going to watch a Skillshare class about marketing, but actually, I ended up watching Storytelling for Leaders, How to Craft Stories That Matter with Keith Yamashita. Got me thinking that I could learn all the marketing skills that I wanted, but that actually, the heart of marketing is being able to tell a good story. Skillshare is also super affordable, and annual description is less than $10 a month. The first 500 of our subscribers to click this link, which is also in the video description below, will get a two-month free trial of premium membership so you can explore your creativity. Hello, I'm Professor Lou. Welcome to our live stream. I'm joined today by art prof teaching artist Jordan McCracken Foster. And today we are continuing our series on how to draw clothing, focusing on the deadfold. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques, tutorials, and professional development. Let's do a little bit of review because we can always use a refresher because we have already covered three fold types and we still have three more to go. So we will keep you guys very busy. So Jordan, what's the lowdown on the pipe fold? Uh, the pipe fold is usually uh, reserved for something that's around a cylinder shape. So around the waist or the legs or, uh, or on a skirt or something like that. And usually the top is more compressed and the bottom is uh, much more loose and it creates these sort of pipe shapes that go all the way around. Basically any A-line dress is pretty much a pipe fold. I've been noticing this, Jordan, with the reference photos. I have to figure out which fashion style and time period matches. And most of the time, it's the Victorian era. I guess they were really into folds back then. <laughs> yeah, well, there's so much going on with them that's kind of it's kind of hard to miss uh, the types of folds that they're using for this. Or if you're Hugh Jackman and oh, you're, you're taking a child away who somehow is not upset that the stranger came and took her away in the middle of the night. And we also have this pipe fold, which is from a film called Victoria and Abdul. It stars Judy Dench. Now, we also have several other streams, for example, the diaper fold. So what is the diaper fold, Jordan? Diaper folds are generally when you have two points of uh, tension and the middle fold that they, or the middle area where there's um, gravity affecting it. So depending on how tight those two tension points are, the looser or more firm that diaper fold will be. We discovered that curtains are a really good place to see diaper folds because actually, again, like a lot of these other ones, I really had to hunt hard to find these reference photos. For example, the red carpet. Actually, the red carpet is great for everything. They have every fold possible, right? Oh, definitely, definitely. There's so much variety in all the dresses that we see and all the celebrities and body types. And it's just, it's an inexhaustible resource for sure. Of course, we have these drawings that Jordan and I did. I've been using colored pencil. Jordan has been doing them digitally. So that way you guys get a broad range of approaches. We have the moving fold with Benedict and Doctor Strange 2 is coming out. <laughs> I mean, it's not coming out. They're just starting. So that probably means it's going to be a while. Well, you know, Doctor Strange is going to be in the next Spider-Man movie. <gasps> That's right. Wait, but is it Benedict or is it somebody else? It's Doctor. Str it's Benedict. It's Doctor Strange. I don't know how the Marvel Universe works. <laughs> I thought I've explained it to you. It's going to be Benedict, Clara. It's going to be Benedict. He That's all I care about. He apparently has a very major role in the film as well. I don't know what it is, but apparently they, it's it's a big role. Good. So basically, if you want to see a moving fold, just go watch the Marvel Universe. There's going to be lots of capes and scarves flying around. Or just look up Lupita Nyong'o. She, she's got all these fancy dresses and all this footage of her like twirling around. So she's she's a very good candidate 
for the moving fold as well. And Misty Copeland, this is a drawing that Jordan did of her. She's a ballerina, very famous one. So, you know, anytime something has a fan involved, you know, in movies when they like put a fan on people. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we also have three folds that we have not gotten to yet, but we will. So what is the half lock fold, Jordan? Uh, the half lock fold is generally uh, at a joint when, when you're bending. So it's either at the elbow or at the knee. Uh, and it's a particular type of pattern that you'll see how they all connect. Um, and they all have a very familiar, similar characteristic, but we won't get to that today. We'll do that next time. <laughs> and you guys will notice that a lot of these folds, a lot of it's about tension and compression. For example, the moving fold, which is like a cape, there's no tension because it's just flowing around. But the zigzag fold, which you guys see here, this is all about compressing the fabric. And you do get these harsher angles in the fold. Why don't you just take your time explaining, Jordan, the spiral fold? Goodness gracious, Clara. Uh, <laughs> uh, spiral folds are also around cylindrical objects like arms or legs. And it's just how the fold will uh, spiral from one end to the other, like, you know, just like a spring. Um, and they'll usually have two or three of those. And you usually see it on um, fabric that's a little thinner uh, because the thinner the fabric is, the more folds you'll see. By the way, Jordan and I will be drawing in a little bit once we explain exactly what the deadfold is. So you guys are all welcome to draw or paint along with us in any media. We would love it for you guys to join us in the stream afterwards in the Art Prof Discord channel. We will be hanging out in the Art Alongs channel. So show us what you guys make. And also, if you would like to get high res versions of the reference photos that Jordan and I will be drawing from today, just go down to the video description below and you guys can get those there because if you draw off the screen, the resolution is terrible. So make sure that you guys do that. Okay, so Jordan, what exactly is the dead fold? Let's get more specific here. Dead folds are generally folds that are like falling on the floor, right? First off, they're, they're on the floor, there's not really any sort of method to them and they're hard to predict, but they can contain just about every single type of fold there is. So you could see half lock folds in there, you could see spiral folds, you could see type of, like it just really depends. And it's one of those things that you really need reference for because it's very unpredictable. I feel like the dud fold is like Pandora's box. It's like, just let it all loose. <laughs> like yeah. everything is out there because some of the other folds are just so predictable. Like the pipe fold, it pretty much does what it tells you it's going to do. It's very easy to figure out what's going on. The dead fold is not like that. And also, depending on the type of fabric, the dead fold can behave very differently. Like this one here where she's wearing this like silky type of outfit, everything looks very wormy for lack of a better word but the image that we saw earlier from westworld i mean how would you describe the fabric here jordan uh it's it's much more stiff um there's a certain uh there's a certain stiffness to it that you can't really get from silk or any of those softer materials for sure so the dead fold it's just so many more factors and i feel that they are definitely dramatized in a way that they oftentimes are not in the other folds. Mm -hmm. And you know what? You guys are always guaranteed to get a dead fold if there's a Buddha. <laughs> Buddhas all have the dead fold. It's perfect. So you just have to figure out who's wearing it the best. And another cool thing about a lot of the images we're going to be looking at today is a lot of these are actually very stylized. And that's where I think drapery gets really interesting because you don't always have to draw drapery accurately, right? Right. I think it, I think the key with us even sharing the principles that we have in this how to draw clothing series is more just about the principles. You know, understand when and where to use a diaper fold or a spiral fold or whatever. Um, but in a situation with dead folds, I definitely would just do whatever makes it look good. 
if the drawing does not look good or is not improved by you adding all these types of uh, patterns in the folds or, or whatever, then remove them. Nikolai says these are the hardest folds to draw. I sometimes avoid them just so I don't have to. Well, we're here to change that, Nikolai, to make sure you don't do that anymore. And Vanessa says, I agree, they are difficult, but I think they are so cool when you know how to draw them. Oh yeah, they can be beautiful. I mean, look at this Leonardo da Vinci drawing. I mean, it's like the fold is a character almost. Yeah. Yeah, there's so much style to it, and it's so uh, it's so strategic the way he's drawing this. And I think that's part that and part of what makes it so challenging is probably because you don't know which fold it is. Like you can't figure it out a lot of the time, and especially when it's a jumble of all these things. And uh, that might be why some people avoid them, but they can really be put to good use for a drawing. And it's really cool to see the difference between Da Vinci's interpretation. And also, if you look at Durer's, I mean, Durer's is practically architectural compared to what you're seeing in the Da Vinci images. So while Jordan and I are going to keep it pretty straightforward in terms of how to draw it, you guys really, I think, ultimately should see all of this content as raw materials. And then you can do crazy stuff like this. Like, this is really stylized, but it still follows the principles do you think jordan oh yeah definitely i mean i could still tell it's deadfold like in the durer piece that we just saw everything is super angular and there's lots of triangles here everything is curved and rounded but there's still the same type of fold the only major difference is the style that it's done in uh, but you could still have a strong intellectual understanding of what's going on and how to create something similar in your own work i think another thing to think about in a deadfold is gravity because you have to think about how to get the dead fold. Something has to fall down and then it has to like squish, mm -hmm. almost like spilled milk or something like that. It's almost like a waterfall or something like that. So there's definitely a rhythm to it that's really different because if you think about the pipe fold, which is the one that's just straight down, it's very stiff. Like it doesn't really have that at all. So that's another way to think about it. Actually, a great place to look at folds is sculpture, because especially in these Bernini pieces, I mean, this dude, it's like, really? Aren't you tired of sculpting this stuff? <laughs> like, aren't these folds driving you a little crazy? Yeah, because it's, it's like, it's bad enough that you're sculpting in marble, but well, you got to do all these folds. So they're amazing. They're perfect for what we want to be talking about. Look at this! The Pieta is a deadfold! Like, did you guys know that? <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited when I found this! I can tell. I can tell. <laughs> no, you're totally right, though. That's a perfect example of a deadfold. And, and the cool thing is you can even see other types of folds in there. Like, there's a diaper fold uh, right underneath the legs as well, and there's probably a pipe fold in the back somewhere. So this is, this is a perfect example of seeing how all these things can merge into one thing. I'm curious, how many people here have seen the Pieta? Because you know what's a bummer? Is it's behind glass and it's far from the glass. Like it's a good 10, 15 feet. So you can't even walk around it. You can't get up close. I guess because somebody tried to damage it at one point. And so they're trying to protect it now by putting it behind glass. But it just makes me really sad because Oh my God, it's such a good sculpture. <laughs> Kathleen says, wow, the Bernini deadfold looks like fondant icing. <laughs> That's great. I just love that. And Dara says, looks at all my sheets lying on the floor because I didn't make my bed this morning. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But Perfect place. Seriously, this is what you guys should be doing. Linear perspective, anatomy, folds, lighting, all these things we're talking about, they all exist in real life. So the more you can look at that bed sheet and say, oh, that's a dead fold, the more you guys are really going to understand how these folds actually work.
By the way, especially for those of you guys who are teachers, our Google slideshows, many of them are available. So if you guys want to reference this later on, even for your own self-study, the link is in the YouTube video description below, and you guys can take a look at that later. Okay, let's get to the drawing part today. And Jordan, I think, who are we starting with? I think we're going to start with <laughs> Lady Macbeth. Oh, yes. Yeah. You know what else I noticed, too? It's always somebody who's, like, collapsed on the ground mm -hmm. because they're about to be executed. <laughs> Is that what's happening in this scene? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm just noticing it's a Buddha, somebody about to be executed, like their head's about to be chopped off, or somebody praying, mm -hmm. or somebody who's really upset. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense because it's all about like clothes on the floor. And for the most part, people aren't willing to have their clothes get all dirty. <laughs> so you got it. It's probably a very extreme situation where all your clothes are like that. So, yeah. And by the way, <clears throat> I want to say thank you to Faber-Castell for providing the colored pencils that I will be using today. These are watercolor pencils, Albrecht Durr. And I'm going to start with black because, you know, she's emerging out of the darkness, blah, blah, blah. I think a black background is a good place to start. Okay. I think you better get rid of Cape Blanchett there, Jordan. I thought... You were saying, wait, is this not Lady Macbeth? I'm that's sorry. not Lady Macbeth, that's Elizabeth. Oh, okay, <laughs> whatever. My bad. Can, can somebody in the chat please explain to Jordan what's the difference between Queen Elizabeth and Lady Macbeth? <laughs> Look, first of all, I've only been up for about 45 minutes, okay? <laughs> you come at me with all these random references and I'm like, okay, and I don't know who they are. <laughs> so... <laughs> Well, I guess we better educate you about Lady Macbeth. <laughs> I, I guess so. I guess so. <laughs> okay, here, here's a challenge for everybody in the chat. Who here can sum up the entire plot of Macbeth in one sentence? You can only do one sentence. You can't do more than that. So that way Jordan can get his Shakespeare education. I... I... I have some Shakespeare education, just not a whole lot. Just not a lot. <laughs> oh, you have to tell everybody about when you were in Midsummer Night's Dream when you were 11. Oh, yeah. I'll show everyone the picture if they want it. Um, oh, my God. <laughs> I'll have to pull it up as I talk. But basically, when I was in the fifth grade, I went to a school that was dedicated to the uh, performing arts and all that stuff. And all the fifth graders had to do a play, a Shakespeare play. And um, I had serious stage fright at the time. I'm sorry, my phone's acting up. I can't, it doesn't want me to show you the picture, I guess. Um, and I had super serious stage fright and they said, uh, they asked us to choose who we wanted to be, but we're probably not gonna get it. And I said, I wanna be an announcer because those guys don't have to worry about like crazy Shakespearean dialogue and they just pop up on occasion and there's not a whole lot that they do. <laughs> for the story they're just there to be fun you know and uh i got to be an announcer and i'm trying to show the photo let me see it's so cute you guys <laughs> you would i can't but, but you I, had to recite shakespeare right or did you just get to introduce the actors uh both, but it was it was for fifth grade, you know, so they got to throw in a lot of comedy in there. So that's me at age 11, and I got to wear whatever I want. That was another reason. You know, everyone else had these specific costumes, and I got to do whatever I wanted. So I do. I wore, like, a Kangol hat. I wore Timberland boots. I wore a Fubu jersey, uh, like, a, uh, like a kente cloth type thing, and some sunglasses. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but thought. wait, did the other kids have to wear old-fashioned clothes? The actors who were in the main part of the show, yes, they did. Uh, their costumes were all picked out. And uh, I was just like, you know, so, because the announcers, they're kind of um, omniscient and they don't really fit in the world the same way. So I could just do whatever I want. 
and uh, it was me and three other kids. Um, and uh, yeah. So you didn't embark on an acting career after that moment? I, you know what's funny? I actually got approached one or two times uh, to act in different places. What? <laughs> yeah, but I was not good at it because I had serious stage fright. Um, uh, like, people, like I remember one time I went to audition for this commercial as a kid. I was like the same age as you saw me in that photo. And, uh -huh. and I, they gave me all these lines. It was like, pretend like as if you're going for a Sprite commercial or something. And I'll be looking up all the time and I'd be like, uh, uh, and it was just sad. <laughs> and so I couldn't overcome that. So that's why you never see me in a commercial. <laughs> I don't know how people can act. I am not one of the, like, I can't dance. I can't act. I can't sing. Like none of those things come easily. Yeah, we gotta ask deep, deep more about all that. But uh, I do know it's challenging. I actually have a friend from high school who's on a TV show now, and it's it's really crazy. I was like, "Yo, that's so cool!" And she said she's next to the set of one of my favorite shows that's currently on. <laughs> what? Yeah, I was like, "This is amazing. That's awesome." So, yeah. All right, W three one five says Macbeth. She convinces him to kill his boss, and he goes crazy from guilt. That's pretty good. Good job. <laughs> and she when she goes guilty from guilt. Well, Lady Macbeth basically convinces Macbeth. Lady Macbeth and Macbeth are together. They're okay. married. Okay. <laughs> so Lady Macbeth is like, you should kill your boss. And he's like, okay. And then he feels bad. I I would hope so. <laughs> That's a terrible <laughs> thing to do. Don't you know that super famous line, like scorpions in my mind or something? Um, first off, no. Second, <laughs> you paraphrased in, you didn't sound sure that that was the actual quote. So double no. <laughs> uh, nailed me on that one. I can't remember. Is it something about scorpions being in your mind? It's just like one of the most famous lines. Michelle says, Prince goes insane because his uncle killed his father to steal the throne. Sorry, Michelle. W.C. says, that's Hamlet. <laughs> awesome. well, I was like, that's, okay, I knew that was Hamlet because I always was told that the Lion King basically takes a lot of cues from Hamlet. And I've never read or seen Hamlet. So I was like, that one sounds Lion King-ish to me. <laughs> oh, wow. Thanks for the spoiler, Angie. And then she died. Well, now I know how the ending is. Great. Way well, to spoil a several hundred year old story. <laughs> I'm sorry to burst your bubble, Jordan, but like everybody dies in Macbeth. Like everybody. See, Claire, this is not what I need to. Why would you do that to me? I don't know the story. <laughs> because you should just know that everybody dies in like every single Shakespeare movie. Um, not movie. Shakespeare story. Haven't you noticed that? Like Romeo and Juliet, they both die. I have noticed that. But the thing is, the suspense comes from no not knowing who specifically is going to die. Okay, like, well, but <laughs> I don't think I should have to give you a spoiler alert for a story that's like centuries old. Well, maybe, <laughs> maybe you're right. I don't know. I still haven't seen it, so. Well, uh, there is a version from 2015 with Michael Fassbender in it, so uh, you know where to go. Sure. <laughs> I, I think you know where to go. I don't know about me. <laughs> Actually, <clears throat> he doesn't look that good in that movie. He's kind of like really dirty the whole time. Ah, I see. <laughs> no, I don't think that they showered much. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, I probably look a little gross too. I didn't shower. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get the you real. See? Soyton Lee says, sounds like Game of Thrones, everybody dies. And Kate Rose is giving you a spoiler for Shakespeare. They probably die. <laughs> That's, I can work with that. They probably die. Okay, fine. I can work with that. because it, it doesn't say specifically who. It probably leaves a little bit to chance for sure. 
Jordan, I'm having trouble with the head. Isn't it sort of like at a weird angle? Uh, I didn't think so. That was like the first thing. I, I usually put the head in first anyway, just because. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, it acts as a center point for me as like a point of reference. And I know that if I can get the head right, pretty much everything else will at least flow a little bit more naturally. Um, I think I was tempted to do the dead fold first because that's what we're focusing on. And then mm -hmm. I was like, no, oh, that's probably not a good idea, <laughs> actually. Well, her head is like a little bit more tilted than I thought it was. It's definitely pressed up against her shoulder. Um, yeah. But, uh, and you know what else is hard about the head is that you can't see the neck. Yeah, that's true. For, for me, the part that makes it difficult is just trying to figure out the angle of the shoulders. Because um, that directly connects with the angle I'll put the neck and uh, all that stuff. And maybe like the size is slightly too small, but yeah. Oh man, you're right. I didn't even look at the angle of the shoulders. Crap. <laughs> Come on now, Claire. Well, you, you know, I'm not the one who understood everything about folds to begin with. So I have an excuse for not understanding this concept. It wasn't the concept. It was the angle of the head, though. In relation to the folds. <laughs> oh, right? oh, I see. It's all related. <laughs> I was like, that, would, that excuse would have worked if it were actually the fold. <laughs> Maria says, Jordan's drawing is looking so cozy. Yeah, that does look cozy. And then everybody dies. <laughs> I don't know. She's really upset in this scene. There, oh. There's like a dead baby that she's like communicating with. Well, this, this is like. Excuse me? Toward, well, I don't remember if it's dead, but there's like a scary looking child in this scene. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's very intense. Okay. I was picturing this scene a whole lot differently in my head, but all right then. Um, good to know, I guess. <laughs> Look at her. She's so she's so distraught. But it's like Lady Macbeth, it was your fault. Like you're the one who told Macbeth to murder his boss. Yeah. So I mean, why I, is she complaining about this? I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly would not know. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that, like, in a lot of X-Men movies, there's always some much better, safer solution they could do with their powers, but somehow they just can't figure it out? Yeah, yeah. That that would make a whole lot of sense. I, a lot of movies are like that. <laughs> like, I you would, know, just do this. That would fix it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. I was watching um, the show Heroes. Last night, I, I'm just starting to get into it. And uh, mm. it's about regular people who develop these superpowers somehow. And there's a mm. lot of things that they run into that I'm like, yo, you could have just, you really didn't have to do all this. You could have gone <laughs> the shorter route. Granted, it would not be good entertainment that way. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it uh, definitely not the smartest thing to do all the time. Well, because, okay, I'm watching X Men 2 because I had to splurge the other day. Uh -huh. And you know the scene at the end where their plane doesn't have enough gas and they're like, oh my God, the spillway is about to come. We're all about to die. <clears throat> and then Jean gets all like, oh my God, I can save them, but I have to die. It's like, Jean, just stay in the plane. Like, <laughs> why did you have to leave the plane? If you were just in the plane, you would have made it out of there, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know what that reminds me of actually? Um, in Avengers Endgame, there's uh, you know, that scene where Tony Stark does the final, makes the final snap, and someone made a meme of Doctor Strange going like this, because in Infinity War he said there's one chance of, of winning of survival. And someone made a meme and it said, fly up, Thanos can't fly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It was, it was so great. <laughs> I was like, dang it, why didn't he do that? Because Tony totally could have gotten away until everyone else was like able to do their thing. We have a question from Michelle who oh. says, how do you simplify the folds and drapes? When I draw clothing and try to draw every fold, it feels so laborsome, but if I don't, then it doesn't feel believable. My suggestion, Michelle, you don't draw every fold. 
So you pick out ones that are the most critical. So let me show you guys right now what I think are the most critical. And then maybe Jordan, you can do something similar because I'm sure you have a different take on it. So if I highlight, which I actually was about to do this in a minute, the folds to me that are the most important, I mean, a lot of times it's just the brightest ones, the ones that have the most contrast, the ones that stick out. But like, if you look at this line down here, I can't live without this line. Like if I don't put this in, I'm screwed. But this line, I can live without that one for now. Eventually I will get to it, but it's not that important. And then down here, there's this like really bright, curly line. That one is also critical. I would also say this one, which is pretty bright. So yeah, I guess a lot of it for me depends on the contrast, but it's like an emergency. Like if you were, your house is burning down, what would you have to take with you? What could you live without? And so think about the drapes that way. What about you, Jordan? Uh, yeah, my, my way of thinking about it is pretty similar. Um, just thinking about the main core shapes and, um, I try and break it down in a way that's just more digestible for me to understand. So like this shape um, right here is kind of like a big triangle. So I'll duplicate that shape here and then I'll say, okay, what's the next major shape? Well, it's probably going to be the split uh, between these two. So then I'll add that. Um, probably the most complex area of the entire fold uh, is her this side of her shoulder and what i do personally is i will uh first off give it get a brighter brush for this um i look at where the kind of I, I try and find an anchor point to see where everything flows from and if you notice most of the folds all come basically from this point and as long as i make sure i keep the focus there um then i can almost make up the rest in a sense if i need to um, and so like, if that's the anchor point, I try to do that with all these places. So <clears throat> another thing you can do too, is not think about it in terms of lines. So let me show you guys. So you see this, I'm seeing what I'm drawing right now more as a shape. I'm not looking at it as far as the line work goes. Cause you can get really lost in the line work. So like here is sort of like a V shape that I'm looking at. So I guess that's kind of what I'm doing now. I wasn't even thinking about it, but I did the outline just so I know where I'm going, but now I'm just sort of bringing out patches of highlight. So it's like a combination of both because if you only do line, yeah, that's gonna be really tough to follow. <laughs> Vanessa says, Watching Jordan drawing is so good. It's like listening to Alex speak makes me feel like everything will be all right. <laughs> Thank you, Vanessa. I appreciate that. I needed that this morning. That's great. Not that and this is great. I, I just needed it. <laughs> this is help from Kate. I feel like with Draper, you have to get in those big shapes first. Otherwise, the forms fall apart. Matthew says, hey, Prof, where did you get this picture? What are some places to look for good photos like these? Guys, these photos, oh my God, they took so long to find. I mean, it usually takes me a while because I'm very picky about the type of photos that I want to get. But um, for some reason, the death fold was really hard. I, why do you think that is, Jordan? Um they're not as common like you like you said in the beginning like you primarily only see when people are like bending or on their knees or about to be executed or whatever um and usually they're not the focus of a scene um at any given point they're not close enough to the face of the of the actor or the character um so that might have one th something to do with it um another thing it might also just be known by a different fold name because actually dead folds can also be called inner folds um it just depends uh, but they mean the same thing. So that could have something to do with it too. I don't know. Well, they're actually, I didn't Google deadfold. I just looked up <clears throat> scenes of movies that I thought were likely to have the right outfits or see, like I was like, okay, who's, who's getting executed? Oh, I know in Westworld, <laughs> they were being executed when they go to Shogun World. Oh, well, that's different. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, so you would Google deadfold? You could. I mean, I might do the same thing that you did if I if I thought of a movie or something like that. But now that I think about it, I don't think there's a lot of movies in my mind where people are wearing drapes like this that they would have a lot of deadfolds. Um, every other one, I probably could think of something. But, uh, yeah. That's, that's... I probably... Let's see. I would Google something like movie costume design scarf, movie costume design cloak. Like I try to think about what is the clothing type I want. Because like if you have a pipe fold, I would probably Google A-line dress because that's fairly similar. Or diaper folds, Victorian era. <laughs> that's what you want for the diaper fold. <laughs> But yeah, so Matthew, that's a great question because it's tricky. I mean, do you have trouble finding references for stuff, Jordan? Um, to be honest, whenever I'm drawing, so so usually when I'm drawing, it's not to specifically like isolate a particular type of fold. I will generally just be like, these are the folds that I can identify in this reference drawing and then just do that. Um, but I okay. never specifically go like, I need to draw deadfolds today. Like that doesn't happen to me, um, but uh, at least not yet. Maybe in the future, uh, that will be the case. By the way, does everybody see this spot here? This big shape. You guys see how that has like this weird pattern on it. What I'm going to do to tackle that is I'm just going to color it white. I'm not going to really try to draw that texture just yet because again that's like cosmetic that's not super ultra important the larger thing is this big shape this big shape of white is the foundation and then i'll put the lines over it when i feel more solid although these two bigger stripes at the end i am going to articulate these because they are they're more pronounced than maybe the ones that are over here and michelle is asking do you worry about shape design when you're drawing the folds, like not having too much symmetry? What do you think, Jordan? Uh, yes, definitely. That kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about having those anchor points. Um, you know, by by placing something like this and just kind of drawing lines like that, even if they all kind of go to the same location, naturally they're going to be different. Uh, parallel lines will typically end up in a, in a less interesting design. And so I try to avoid that as much as possible, unless it's for a very specific reason. Also, I don't know too many times you'll see parallel lines in nature, um, just naturally forming um, where someone didn't plan that, you know? Um, I don't know, I feel like there's always gonna be some sort of thing pushing out or pulling back in, you know what I mean? I oftentimes feel like nature is so, f quote, flawed that nature is actually really easy to draw from because there's not a lot of symmetry. Things don't line up. It's just like naturally good composition, you know? Yeah. Best reference ever. Like you don't have to work that hard when you're drawing from natural life because it's like it, the work is done for you. The, the forms are already interesting. They already have a lot of variation. And so that's a really... Nice thing. Okay, might move on. Gurgana says, Prof Lu, I'm noticing you're holding the pencil differently in these beginning stages than what I'm used to seeing you do when you draw with graphite pastels charcoal. Is there a specific reason for it? I mean, it's colored pencil and I just can't, like if I draw like this, th this is really hard to control. But yesterday in the paint along, that's totally what I wanted because the brush is a different beast. And when I do charcoal, I tend to like to draw with the side instead of the tip. This is all tip. Like, I don't really have an option. Although, I do sometimes like to use these Caran d'Ache crayons. Let me show you guys the box. Sometimes these are really nice, like, especially when I'm doing white patches of tone on black paper. This white crayon, it's just a little bit more opaque than the colored pencil. I don't do this until I'm done, though, because the colored pencil it won't go over the crayon but the crayon does go over the colored pencil so this is like when i'm almost done but 
I do find that this helps me fill in the blanks when I'm feeling like that tip is a little bit too much work. Okay. I think I might move on to the next one. I think I've done what I've wanted. Oh God, you're so fast. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, you just like blow through all these, like, I can't, I really, I've, I don't know. I love this picture. I think she looks amazing. <laughs> that is a nice, it is a nice drawing. For me, it's just like, I know that if I were to continue working on it, I would want to do like clean lines, like super clean lines and all that stuff. And we don't have time for that in the stream. So I'd like, you know, I might as well just move on <laughs> and do. Well, the cleanup is so time consuming, isn't it? It is. It's very time consuming. And I spend a lot of time trying to get my lines to look right. And um, I, you know, I kind of slave over it in a way. And it's not, it's not very time sensitive at all. <laughs> oh, you totally slave over it. I mean, I, I don't know how you get such clean lines. The only way I can imagine is that you just spend forever on it. Isn't that it? Pretty much. Um, I'll do two or three like rounds of sketch layers um, to make sure it's as close to what I want as possible. And then I'll go over it and spend a lot of time just making sure each line is really strong, that it's not fuzzy or that it's, uh, that they're thick enough to make the expression that I want. It's challenging. It's really, really challenging. But even that takes forever. Like no matter how much you prep and get yourself ready to address everything, it's still like, oh, you just gotta log the time. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I like the sketch phase a lot more, to be honest. Uh, uh, it's faster and, uh, you know, I could still get a good result, generally speaking, but right. I, but no one ever wants the sketch. They always want the final. And so, of course. And so you know, I got to, until I get much faster, um, that's kind of what I'm working with. But the good news is that I know I'm not by myself. There's many artists that I look up to that take a long time to do their line work. And so I feel like I'm in good company. Some stuff, it, it just takes forever. Like there's no way around it, right? It's like, it doesn't matter how experienced you are. It just takes forever. Yeah. And I think a lot of the emotion is exacerbated by the fact that we have time-lapse videos and, <gasps> you know, which I enjoy watching, don't get me wrong, but it does give a flawed sense of what someone's actually doing and how long it's actually taking them. Like I was looking at a video of someone painting an environment piece on the iPad and the video is like eight to 10 minutes long, but it took him 20 hours to do it. <sighs> and so, and, he, and thankfully he says that in the thing, otherwise, you know, otherwise I'd feel really bad. Uh, but that's just the reality. Art takes a while and uh, you know, just gotta gotta make it work somehow. I mean, sometimes I'll admit I feel like the advice we give is very boring. It's like, yep, it just takes forever. <laughs> yep, yep. There, there's actually I just got a message from uh, someone I'm mentoring uh, earlier today, and uh, asking about like, hey, do you have advice on how to get faster and stuff? And I was like, literally, just do it. Like, I, can, I cannot. Yeah. Like, you can't shortcut your way around that, and it's um, you know. I wish there were another way. I wish there was a magic pill or something that everyone could take, like Neo and, the, and Morpheus or something. <laughs> but uh, the reality is if you wanna be a really solid artist and you wanna understand these principles that we've been sharing, you just have to apply them, uh, get it in your brain and just keep working at it. That's the only shortcut that I can think of. And that's not even a shortcut. That's just- That's not reason. a shortcut. <laughs> yeah, that's like, that's the, you know, learn it as quickly as you can. That's probably the best way and draw as much as you can. But um, yeah. I was talking to this art teacher and they were like, oh, my students, they weren't able to take this preliminary drawing class. They don't have a lot of experience. How can I speed up the process? I'm like, you can't, they didn't take the class. So like, <laughs> there, there really is not a way to speed that up. You can't compensate for not having a foundations drawing class. Right. And, and you know, the, the thing is, is like, all the stuff that's going to make you faster and better is all the boring stuff. Yep. You know? Like not like I am not particularly enthralled by studying light and shadow, but I know how important it is. <laughs> and yeah. I can't, uh, can't, you know, forget about it. Otherwise I'm going to have some really bad lighting in my projects. So 
same with composition, same with design principles, you know, all those fundamentals may not be fun to talk about, but they're completely necessary. Shanza is asking, what should I look for when getting references on such flowy attires? Any tips? Well, if you want flow, Shanza, you're going to want a really soft fabric, like silk or what is it? Organza. I have no idea what all these fabric names are called. But sometimes it's like you have to look for the type of fabric. Have you done that, Jordan? Yeah, I think that understanding different types of fabric and the thickness of them and what they, uh, what attributes they have is really gonna help when it comes to finding reference for them. Because, you know, if I'm drawing leather versus silk, those are two very different materials and they're gonna have two very different physical languages. So, um, so yeah, I would start understanding that. And quite honestly, you could just go in your closet and start figuring some of this stuff out. Like, oh, this is thicker. Therefore, there will be less folds. Therefore, blah, 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 blah. You know, and just repeat that. This is a comment from Macaws. For me, it's like the exact opposite. I sort of look at everything as lines rather than shapes. I learned to draw most of the things that way and it just stayed with me. Whatever works, you guys, there's no correct way. Look at me and Jordan. I mean, Jordan, you're like the line king and I am all about tone. For me, line is not a natural tendency. I think for you, you think in line, don't you? Oh yeah, definitely. Matter of fact, there's a, there's something, so I've been doing a character design course uh, for Project Open Door. We talked about it on our winter winter raffle stream, actually. And uh, one of the things that I told the students was when you're creating silhouettes for characters or, or quick thumbnails, there's two methods. But generally, people will do like a quick um, silhouette where it's like everything's super blocked out and they try to come up with funky shapes. And then some people just do like really quick lines. And I can't think in these blocky shapes the same way. I have to think in line, otherwise I won't ever get anything done and everything's just gonna look terrible. So I have to combine all that stuff. Which I mean, that's not to say you should just do one thing. I think you should try other stuff. I mean, you've tried tone and you're like, oh, that's not the way I think. Okay, I'm gonna do this. Right. Yeah, That that's the other thing about, um, listening to uh other artists sometimes is like whatever method works for them doesn't always work for everyone else um and that can be a challenge like there are times where i've had teachers who just thought differently and they were trying to explain things to me and i'm like yeah no this ain't gonna work buddy this is not gonna work. <laughs> you're gonna have to work with me on this like um actually even with um even with figure drawing i remember one time at RISD i took a, a anatomy class and everyone was using the compressed charcoal that you all know I love so much. <laughs> yeah, I was spending a lot of time and I went up to my teacher and I was like, look, ma'am, I don't mind doing all the figures. So I don't even mind working in charcoal for this class, but please, can I just use a pencil? And he said, well, yeah, as long as you get the, you know, I expect more detail from you. I was like, I can do that. I can work with that. <laughs> and I was tearing it up. Like, <laughs> like people were, I would do these giant drawings with pencils and just kill it. And I was like, I think that way, it helps me. <laughs> yeah, and the thing is you were a senior at that point, so it's not like you were just getting started. Yeah, well, actually I was a junior, I was a junior. Oh, you know, it's not like it was your first year of art school and you had very little experience. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because you were my first drawing teacher at RISD. <laughs> Isn't that so funny? You were like, you were like 18 when I met you. I was, and now I am no longer 18. Yeah, you're you're so old, Jordan. I don't know what you're talking about. I, I've been, you know what? Several people have said that to me, and I'm like, no, I am the epitome of youth. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I have no gray hairs. I got no wrinkles. I don't know what you're all talking about. I'm going, I, you know, I'm fine. <laughs> if anything, I'm a little wiser, hopefully. <laughs> we have a comment from Kishi who says, you could search for an Indian outfit called Sari. It's just a piece of cloth draped. Dude, whoever came up with the Sari, that looks so comfortable. Like, I would just love to wear that all day. <laughs> it's 
instead of like pants. That would be awesome. I don't know what it looks like. I, otherwise, I would comment on it. <laughs> and Carol is asking, what are the rules for painting the colors of shiny fabrics? Any tips, Jordan? Shiny fabrics? Well, if it's shiny, the probably the key feature is going to be highlights, but I would save that till the very end because um, that that's what that's the difference between something that's matte and something that's shiny. When you have that little spark of uh, the highlight from whatever light source you have, um, I would stick to probably more desaturated colors in the lighter areas and more saturated colors in the shadow areas. Um, and then just, you know, whatever fabric you're doing, just determine how you paint based off of that. You know what I think helps Carol is the highlights are not very soft. They're really harsh highlights. Whereas like Lady Macbeth, I don't know, I mean, she looks like she's wearing like a burlap sack or something. But anyway, I feel like on shiny clothing, things are just very harsh. Like the edges are not that slow to gradate. And so maybe if you look for that, it's tricky. I mean, Jordan, I feel like we could do a whole stream just on shiny fabric, you know? Yeah, probably. Um, yeah, that's tough. That, that, that's a tough one. And that that's one of those things that comes from observation. Um, the other thing, I would also say is um, wherever your highlights are should be coming should be on the plane that the high, that the light is coming from like direction like if the light is coming from right here then I would expect to see highlights that are directly matched to that surface you know I wouldn't expect to see a highlight on the bottom of this fold you know down here so just keep those things in mind and keep that consistency because. Um, even if you diverge from a uh, reference, as long as you're consistent, no one will really mind. <laughs> I, at least that's what I've found. I also think it really helps to know how light works. And we did do a stream the other day about shadows. We are going to do one about highlights next month, and then we'll break down natural light and all that stuff. But it's like all these things that we're talking, they all work together. It's like that elements of art stuff we've been doing. Shape definitely plays a role in this drawing. So it, it all blends together. This one's coming along. Abdul Qadir says, oh my God, this has been my nightmare since forever. Drawing these folding clothes are like torture to me. Any tip how it can make it more fun? Um, well, anything that I suggest to make it more fun may or may not work for anyone else. <laughs> so <laughs> so that's, that's a challenge right there in and of itself. Um, but, uh, you know, if let's, for example, okay, let's say, um, oh, you know, we'll use Claire as an example, right? <laughs> Clara has put in multiple references of uh, Hugh Jackman and Michael Fassman <laughs> and Cumberbatch and all this stuff. And all these men that uh, are very admirable, <laughs> <laughs> and we turn them in, and we turn them into these drawing streams. And we rec and, and you know, for her that's a lot of fun. And for me, I get a kick out of it too. I'll be honest. But uh, <laughs> but that's a method that she's using. And so maybe do something like that. If you like superheroes, draw the superheroes you want. Or if you like, you know, a certain type of uh, clothing style, like Victorian era or whatever, um, draw a bunch of that. And uh, whatever you find interesting, as long as you're learning these principles. Definitely. So pick, pick a movie you like, pick a character you like. Because it shouldn't be torturous. If it's torturous, you're, you're not gonna learn. I mean, I can't learn when I'm like in pain. Yeah, that's the worst. It's almost impossible <laughs> in my opinion, actually. Then you're like resentful the whole time about having to do it. And then you're not having a good time it makes you wanna do it even less. Right, actually the best teachers I've ever had um, that were not art classes were the ones who just made the class interesting. You know, yeah. like I, I rem even if I don't remember everything about that class from every week, 
if I can remember something because of the, the enthusiasm that the professor had, then that makes a huge difference. And that can be applied to art. Like if you can at least make it fun for yourself or fun for whoever you're sharing it with, it'll make that memorable experience and they will not forget it very easily. My tip for a lot of students, because when people go off to college, everybody's like, oh, what's your piece of advice for college students? My piece of advice is when you're picking your classes, pick them by the teacher. Don't pick them by the subject. Because a lot of people think, oh, I really like jewelry design, so I should take a jewelry design class. And I mean, that's fine. You, you can definitely do it that way. But when I was in college, I always picked it by the professors. So I would ask upperclassmen, I would say, hey, who's a good professor? And they'd be like, oh, yeah, I take a class with this person. And it's like, if you have a good teacher, they can make anything fun. Mm -hmm. Also, a good teacher will probably have a lot of... Um, a lot of knowledge about other areas other than what that class specifically is. Um, you know, like for example, I went to school for video game design, uh, but a lot of the artists or a lot of the teachers that I have were, had worked in animation and I worked in film. And so they had that knowledge that they could apply as well. And if I felt like, hey, I wanna do this instead, they were able to support me in that way because they had that vast knowledge. Sometimes a teacher is just, you know, there's assigned to that class specifically but they often, in gen like almost 100% of the time, have a knowledge that's way wider than that class when it comes to art. Oh, for sure. I mean, I've taught printmaking classes, but it's like, there's a lot of other stuff I can do too. Like <laughs> printmaking's not the only thing. Right. This is funny. Carolyn says, I feel Jordan's Lady Macbeth was warm and cozy. Prof. Luz shows the madness. <laughs> <laughs> but see, I love that we can interpret things so differently from each other. Part of it is probably because I don't know what Lady Macbeth is all about. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. You didn't see her being so horrible. She's yeah. so bad. Yeah, like if we were to draw Walter White or something like that, I bet you I could make him look like really, really scary. <laughs> I'll tell you, Jordan, I tried to watch Breaking Bad. I, I couldn't get into it. That's that's fair. I, some people can't. My mom is loving it. She's watching it for the very first time. And she's like, I'm getting to my show after you get off the phone or something. And she ended up accidentally binging like the first season and a half. <laughs> in wow. like a couple of days. I'm like, wow, okay. She likes this show. I mean, everybody's like, no, 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 it gets really good. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but that scene where they had to dissolve the body, I just was like, oh my God, I can't watch this. <laughs> Fair enough. It's not for everybody. I didn't think I was going to like it as much as I did. And I was like, I'm too invested in this guy now. Like, I need to know. I need to know. Blue Wolf is asking, why did you switch to the blue pencil? I think because I felt bad that I was just using black and white and that I should punch it up a little bit. But now I feel that the blue pencil is actually complicating things. And if I do the blue pencil in one place, I have to put it everywhere so it doesn't look like a sore thumb. So I think today I might just keep things more simple and just stick with the black and white. Because uh, guys, I learned Adobe Fresco and how to animate and procreate this week within 48 hours and i did a two and a half hour paint along yesterday so i just need my life to be more simple i am so proud of you clara that's awesome you were so terrified of procreate when we first started well i still sort of am but i'm getting better hey but you know what i wouldn't even touch adobe fresco that confused me i was like what is this nope <laughs> well i get that though because Adobe Fresco is weird. It's like, it's like if Photoshop and Procreate had a baby. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so it might actually confuse you more because you are good at Procreate. You know what I mean? Yeah. It just, for me at this point, like the digital software that I have, I'm like, I don't need to switch unless I need to do something completely different. Like, uh, you know, like, after effects or in desire or something, but right. with the general drawing tools I got, I'm okay with this. Yeah. Well, for you, I mean, you don't wanna, 
there's not a compelling reason for you to learn that software. I mean, I guess if they started using it at your job, you would. But Yeah, but I don't think they really care and in the industry, like what you use so much as getting it done, unless it's for like storyboarding or something, that's probably a bit different. But as a character designer, I'm just saying, here's who, here's what I have for this character. And they either say, yes, do that, or nope, change it. So that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> Dara says, I'm drawing the same figure as Jordan. I'm making up the folds in the skirt. You can definitely tell. <laughs> well, do you think sometimes, Jordan, that's not a bad idea? Well, I'm confused. Definitely tell tell what? I'm... Ma making up the folds. Oh, oh, okay. Um uh no, I don't think it's a I don't think it's bad as long as it makes sense, you know, like um for example, if you're painting a sky and you have a little bit of orange in there or a little bit of pink in there, or a little bit of green in there or whatever. It's not necessarily wrong. You just gotta make sure it makes sense. So if it's a super cloudy day and you know it's raining or something and you suddenly put pink in there, that might not make a whole lot of sense for your scene. Um, but you know, that's kind of the principle I go by is like, can I convince people that this is what's really happening? Then if I can, I'll use it. If not, then... Uh, I'll change it. Makes my life simpler when I think of it that way. Another thing too, you guys, is sometimes you draw from the reference and you're like, I'm so accurate. This is exactly the reference. It still looks weird in the drawing. You ever notice that? Oh yeah. That's, I, that's where um, knowing the principles of design and simplifying will really make sense. Cause sometimes there are more folds in real life than you want to draw because it just becomes confusing. Um, and so there, there is the artistic license aspect that comes with that, where you can just say, yeah, I'm editing this out. I am simplifying this. I'm changing this to make it make more sense. Um, cause what if let's say you're the character that you're drawing is a different body type. Let's say they weigh a hundred pounds more than the reference that you have. Then the folds are probably gonna look a little bit different. You know, the, the way, you know, it, everything it has variables to it. And so you just have to adjust for that, just like with anything else. By the way, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I've just started drawing the floor. And I actually think that that's pretty important for the deadfold. Like anytime something makes physical contact with another surface, it's kind of like, do you ever see where people are in figure drawing class and they're drawing a seated figure, but they draw everything but the stool? Yes, I've made that mistake many times. Even recently <laughs> oh, of course but it's like you don't think to put in the stool because you're so focused on the figure but mm -hmm. i think for the dead fold it's like it really makes a difference because i'm thinking about where the shadows are sharp against the floor and where they sort of blend in a little bit more mm -hmm. yeah. so like here it's very sharp here it's not so sharp because of the shift in the tone so those of you guys who are still drawing crazy Lady Macbeth. <laughs> Jude is asking, what's the difference between a sketch and a finished drawing? How do I progress from doing sketches to doing finished drawings? Um, a finished drawing to me is either when you say it's done or the deadline comes up. Um, <laughs> that's usually when you're finished. Uh, Cause I can definitely slave over some drawings I've already turned in like even more. Um, but the sketch though is meant to be looser. It's meant to, just like with thumbnails, it's meant to be a really quick version of what the final is going to be, um, it, you know? And so I try not to, I usually do all my thinking in a sketch um, and then the final line, that's where I can kind of calm down a little bit and just say, I've done all my thinking. All I have to do is make it look pretty now. And that is kind of a, I put my mind in a different place. Um, but as far as, you know, telling the difference, I guess it depends on the artist. Sometimes people have much neater line work or painting sketches than other people. So. 
I think for me, the difference is probably that I know it's done when I don't feel like I'm changing very much. You know, you can sort of like pick at a drawing and you're like, yeah, I'm working on it, but is anything really changing? That that to me is usually like, okay, you, you got to stop because you're not really making anything better and nothing's really changing. So what's the point of working on it so long, right? Yeah. Th there's actually an artist on YouTube named uh, Bobby Chu who said something like that. And he said that uh, anytime he feels like he's not learning anymore when he's working on a piece, he just stops. Yeah. Because um, he's, he's very much into the idea of like constantly learn new stuff, learn new skills to apply to your work and in whatever way is possible. And he's like, yeah, I'm not learning anything else. I've, I've mastered everything that I can at, to this point, and I'm just going to stop now. And, uh, it might save frustration, too, when you do it like that. Well, because it's annoying to feel like you're working on the piece and nothing's happening, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. There have been so many times where I've repainted over the same thing like six or seven times and not knowing which one looks better. Like, maybe I should have stepped with a third version of this paint over. Maybe I should... And that just, that frustrates me. And at that point, I'll just end up moving on to a new painting. Like, and I'll go like, maybe I'll come back to this one, maybe I won't, whatever. It is what it is. I mean, it really helps to step away. Like if I'm not sure, I'll put it away and then I'll look at it in like a week. And then I can say more objectively, oh yeah, yeah, I do need to work on this more. Or like, oh no, 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 I'm definitely done. So it, getting that distance is very helpful. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to not finish every piece too. Like there's, unless it's for a client, there's no reason why you have to finish every single sketch that you start. We have a question from Hellish D. I'm using pastel colors. I find it hard to really define the lines or is this okay in pastel painting? Any tips? I mean, I can't really give you an accurate answer without looking at the piece and seeing what's going on, but of course, fine <laughs> like Jordan, so much of the time at RISD I'd have students and you're like can I do that I'm like yeah did I tell you you couldn't like <laughs> like you don't need permission to try something if you think that's gonna get you the results you want then do it right yeah except when it comes to if you want to use something other than charcoal in class then you have to get permission usually exactly <laughs> I mean, if you're in a class situation, that, that is a little bit different because there's, no <laughs> there's expectation, da, da, da. Yeah. but I'm just always going to be salty about it. That's all. Of course. <laughs> I'm allowed to be salty. Of well, that. Jordan, have I told you that I'm only nice to people I don't like? No, and now it scares me because you're nice to me. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. Not nice. Polite. <laughs> oh, okay. Polite. That's what I meant. Got it. Like if I comment on your sweater, you're you're in trouble. Oh snap! Okay, now the whole world knows that. Now everyone's gonna just wear ugly sweaters whenever they meet you. <laughs> oh, crap! Now now my secret is out. People know because you know you gotta kill them with kindness. Yes, yeah, that is true. It becomes fun that way too. I, I like when people, there, there are times where I got into really bad arguments with people on Facebook and I was just like, have a great day. And they would be like, <laughs> like <laughs> and then they would have the la try and have the last word and then make themselves look really stupid. And I'm like, it's just great. Facebook really makes people behave that way though. I think a part of that is the platform. Like I, I never get into fights on Instagram. You know what I mean? That's true. Well, mm -mm -mm. well, I've gotten into some fights, but because I don't have the time or the energy to debate people right, right. in a section on Instagram, I just don't care. Um, no, I, I guess not that I get into fights, but where somebody is like, bah, 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 and I'm like, okay, goodbye. Like, yeah. I don't have time for this. Yeah, I was like, if I spend my whole day arguing with you on Instagram, I'm not doing enough with my life. That's how I feel. Exactly. I mean, dude, I got better things to do. I got stuff to draw. This one's kind of tough because she's all in the sand. It's really tricky. 
Elizabeth says, Clara, Lady Macbeth's face is so spooky. Don't develop it further. Yeah, I'm not going to. Actually, I was not planning on that because the whole point of this drawing is the drapery. But but yeah, it, it does sort of fit the tone of the piece. See, that that's another thing. It's like just because the detail is there, it doesn't mean you have to put it in. Like that face is detailed and the reference photo, and I could do more detail, but I'm choosing to not do more detail. You know what I see when I look at that? I just see her going, get out. <laughs> 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 That's the only thing I'm thinking of. That's so funny, because in the scene, she acts like really frail. She's like, <laughs> she's like crying her face off. Yeah, I, I would not want to be there. By the way, Jordan and I, speaking of fights, Jordan and I have been in a fight, you guys. You gotta help <laughs> us out, okay? Because Jordan sends me on Instagram this picture of Spider-Man and Wolverine fighting. And he's like, Spider-Man would win. And I'm like, you're so full of crap. No way. So we need to hear from the audience. Who would win in a fight? Wolverine or Spider-Man? Who, who is it? I mean, I think you guys know what we think, but. <laughs> Are we presenting our arguments like a crit clash or something? Or we okay, okay, we gotta present the arguments. Okay, so here's the thing. The whole healing thing, no way. Like if Spider-Man gets hurt, he bleeds. If Wolverine gets hurt, he's fine. You know, just give him a few minutes. That alone, come on, you can't argue with that. Yeah, but Spider-Man can heal too. <laughs> No, he doesn't. Not in the same way. Not the same way. Like, he, he doesn't regrow limbs, but, like, he could still heal very quickly. Um, and you, you made a comment on our, on, our, on our chat, and you were saying something about um, Wolverine's, like, brute strength and Spider-Man being, like, a super skinny kid. First of all, Spider-Man does hold back a lot of his power. Um, there was apparently a comic where, where, I don't know how this worked, but apparently he, like, switches bodies with Doc Ock, and Doc Ock realized... What? Yeah, I don't know how that storyline worked. I didn't read it. But apparently, Doc Ock was like, oh, man, he's been holding back this whole time. He's like 10 times stronger than he's been letting on. So there's that. And then also, there are plenty of MMA fighters who are really scrawny and small, and they will whoop guys who are these big and brawny, tough, tough men. So, yeah. Claws, Jordan. Adamantium claws. How are you gonna compete with that? Spider-Man can crawl on walls and dodge all that and, got, and he's got spider sense and he's got his webs. <laughs> yeah, but Wolverine can like sit on him and he would kill him in a second. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you resort to uh, sitting, resort to sitting on someone in a fight, you, you automatically lose. <laughs> Especially if you're- I'm just saying, in theory, if Spider-Man was like, okay, cool, yeah, you can sit on me. Oh, he would squash. Like I'm, I'm just saying, like voluntarily. Why would he? Why would he even volunteer? That? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's a dare. Maybe he's like, I dare you to sit on me. I bet you anything, I can survive. And Wolverine's like, sure, okay. And then he dies. I, what? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know what? I will fairly say I can't compete with that one because I don't even understand that. <laughs> Same hypothetical situation. When is the last time you've heard of a superhero sitting on another one? I don't know. About three seconds ago when you brought the situation up. I don't know. It might exist in some film and film history somewhere. Somebody had a dare. Oh, someone has a really good comment. Um, uh, Wolverine couldn't even catch Spider-Man. He could just web swing all over the place, says Jason. Um, and then... Let's see, does Wolverine's claws cut through Spider-Man's webs? That's the other thing. I don't know because Spider-Man, his webs are so strong that he could like web up parts of planes to buildings and they stay for several hours. So I don't even know. <laughs> and then Dara says Spider-Man could formulate a claw-proof web. So. Uh, yeah, but then he'd have to like go hang out in his science lab and figure it out. That would take a while. Yeah, but. Peter Parker is a, a super genius, so that's like <laughs> that's fine. If I if I was a super genius and I knew I was fighting Wolverine, I'd probably take some time to figure it out too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but what if you don't have time? What if he just like 
whips your ass before you have time to get into the lab. I don't think, I, I honestly don't even think Wolverine would get that far because Spider-Man would just be like, oh, I'm on the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but see, then he's just like postponing it. You know what I mean? Then he's, he's not really fighting. He's just running away. It's not my fault. If, look, if Wolverine doesn't have as high endurance as Spider-Man, then that, that's not my problem. <laughs> I don't think Wolverine has a problem with endurance. He doesn't, but if he can't keep up, then what is he? What else is there? You know, actually, there was one time, there was a Spider-Man video game where you get to switch between Spider-Man and Venom, and as Venom, uh -huh. fight Wolverine. It's actually really fun. <laughs> but do do can you kill him or not? No, you don't kill him, but you do... You do beat him up really well. Uh, he really? does, yeah. But it starts because Venom is like in a crazed state, and he, for whatever reason, throws his motorcycle into the bar while Wolverine's drinking. He's like, "Dude, what the heck, man? You just tore up my bike." And uh, yeah, <laughs> it took me quite a few tries to beat him. I will say that he was tough. <laughs> oh shoot! I'm losing all my pencils. See, I think that the audience is with me, Jordan. Are you kidding? <laughs> There's no, no, like Wolverine. <laughs> that showed they were rooting for Spidey. Come on. Oh, this comment, this comment's for you. I feel like Spider-Man would just be too astonished by Wolverine's beauty to actually fight him. <laughs> I would work on me. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, I'm not going to put up a fight with you. It's fine. <laughs> That's why, Jordan, I was watching X-Men 2. I'm like, Jean Grey, you're so stupid. Like, he's throwing himself at you. And you're like, no, I'm married to Cyclops. It's like, really? That, that, that's who you're going to go for? <laughs> I'm not gonna get into that. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so, you know, one thing that I've been doing, you guys, is I've been trying to build up the whites to make the highlights more prominent. So, if it helps you, if you're a tonal person like me, pull out the highlights. So basically what I'm doing is I'm trying to emphasize some folds and then let other ones fall back, if that makes any sense. Do you do that? Uh, yeah, definitely. I, I don't see the need to have a focus on every little thing, you know? Um, so, yeah. Well, I think that's sort of what it is. It's like there, there's sort of a hierarchy. Like you have to say, okay, these folds are very important. These are less important. I want these to stick out. And so that's what I'm doing right now with the white crayon is I'm just going out and I'm, I'm pulling out what I think are like the brightest, most dramatic areas. Because otherwise it's like, I think with clothing, if everything looks too similar, it gets really boring. Mm. Yeah. It, I, I like thickening up, thickening, thickening up the lines. And um, like, even just now, I just shaved the jacket a bit just to give some differentiation between that and some of the other articles of clothing that she's wearing. So it totally makes sense. Oh, this feels good. Putting these highlights in. Awesome. Just love that. Yeah, it's always nice. So I, I like that stage. It takes forever to get there, but it is really nice when you can finally put those down. Well, you know, it's like I spend so much time holding off, you know, I'm like, okay, you will eventually get to put those in. But it's like you got to resist the temptation because it would have been too soon. Like I needed to build up the form in the grays first before I could let myself do that. Okay. I actually do like this like pattern that's on her dress. It's kind of cool. Yeah, I like how these came out. See, you guys, you just draw some horrible wife character and you'll learn how to draw clothing <laughs> never thought i'd hear that sentence in my life but well, it's here whatever, now. whatever gets you excited about drawing and if it's a murderous well she's not murderous she's just trying to get somebody else to do her dirty work that's that's murderous 
she just well, I guess she she would be an accomplice, right? Like she wouldn't actually get put in jail for the actual murder. Maybe not, but if it's her, but if it's her who set the whole plot up, um, I don't know. As the mastermind, I feel like she probably would get in some form of trouble over that. Well, do you get a, a worse sentence if you plan it but don't do it? Wouldn't that wait if you don't do it? I mean. Like physically don't do the murder, but you actually like plan the whole thing. I don't know. And I guess it depends on uh, if they get caught. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know, it's like, if it's like three people away or, you know, th three people removed or something like that. I don't know. You might not. I don't ever want to find out. I'll put it like that. I'll watch movies for that. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, guys. That about wraps up our video for today. Uh, please join us in the Art Prof Discord in the Art Alongs channel, and you can show us all your awesome artwork that I know you all have been doing. Subscribe to the Art Prof YouTube channel, and we also wanna say thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. You guys are so amazing and so consistent and so awesome, and none of this can be done without you guys. So have a great rest of your day, keep drawing, and we'll see you next time. Peace.